So thanks all for coming and just again thanks to Camille and Alex for setting all this up, right? Um, what I'll do is I'll just do a little brief introduction of what the talk's going to, the way I think the talk works or the series of talks works. And we'll also introduce the three people who will be talking to you tonight, right? Um, they'll each give about a 10 minutes or so uh, at discussion. Afterwards, open up for questions. I might respond a little bit. If anyone's a little bit nervous or shy, I might want questions of my own. I want to ask anyway. Right. Um, but the talk itself, maybe, um, we might think, well, why do you have a couple of academics and a couple of artists and practitioners um, uh, talking about a fairly obscure figure? This guy, a Malay assistant, Ali, a Malay assistant to Alfred Russell Wallace, um, who, for some of his time in this part of the world, he's first mentioned in the Malay archipelago as a Malay boy who helps out Wallace and Sarawak. And then Wallace brings it back to Singapore and he accompanies Wallace on his travels across the archipelago. And John will talk more about that. And I think the reason that Ali and maybe many of the speakers um, take something were interesting certainly to me is that this division between history and fiction or history and art that we always talk about, and we think it's a very definite distinction, is actually quite a porous distinction. Right? It's not as clear as it might seem at first. Um, certainly all historical works abide by certain notions of truth-telling. They play a certain kind of truth game. But they're also stories, and they're governed by issues about what you leave out, what you include, what you emphasize. Yeah, they have heroes, they have villains. Um, that always happens in historical narratives. Um, and I think what's interesting um, for me is that history continually changes. We tend to rewrite history, you know, um, uh, for the purposes of the present. Every generation, every generation's history is later, right? Um, so I think this process of dialogue between historians and artists can help us reflect upon this notion of history nation, right? Um, and especially for me, I'm someone that actually studies biography. And I think what I really I'm interested in biography is it seems to be this place where these meaning makings from art, from fiction, and from history come together. An individual becomes representative of a time, a place, a conflict, an idea, right? Um, most Singaporeans don't talk about nationalist historiography, but everybody responded in various ways to the death of the and that was some ways about something about Singapore and something about a lived history, right? Um, we may not discuss in abstract issues of freedom of expression, care to others, right? But I think we're all transfixed in various ways by the spectacle of ABSG, right? On, uh, on various platforms at the moment, right? Um, and in particular, I think what sometimes writers are interested in, and artists in, are these figures who have forgotten history, these figures who have written out of history. And then, can we bring them back to life? Can we reanimate them in some way? And Ali's um, certainly one. At the same time, this act of relating to history also raises ethical questions. How do you interpret the past? Right? Um, are there notions of truth we should abide by? Or is everything fair game? Right? Um, are notions of truth limited? Right? Um, are artists and historians fundamentally different in the way they think about the past and the figures from the past as well? Or are there points of convergence? So I'll leave it at that for now. Um, first, the individual presentations, and maybe what I'll do before John starts, I'll just introduce our three panelists who will go sequentially one after another. 
So first, John Van Wy, historian of science, senior lecturer in the Department of Biological Sciences, and a fellow of Tungusu College, National University of Singapore. So really someone rather interesting who's bridging that gap between the sciences and history. And um, I won't go into the, the full details, but he's been working intensely, I think, over the last decade or more on two figures, Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace. Um, he's the author of books, um, and more recently, he's actually um, edited um, Wallace's The Malay Archipelago. He's uh, created exhibitions in Cambridge, many, many, uh, many things. I'll leave you maybe say a little bit more about that. So I guess you could say, well, John is a historian, although you may want to quarrel with that. You may want to uh, uh, say, you know, I'm an artist as well, as a certain kind of way. Right? We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, second up in terms of order is Isabel uh, Dijon. Uh, she's an artist based in Singapore. And interestingly, she's another of these boundary crosses, right? Um, she's got a background, a PhD in molecular biology, which I find very intriguing, right? And then a Master of Arts from the South. Um, right? And she, what she says is like her um, research is based on the refuse, the leftovers, and the failures and their function in a process of scientific research. And I think one of the things that she come, um, she, the reason she's here tonight is she made a very intriguing video about Ali, um, narrated in French, um, which looks at first sight like a documentary, but I think is doing some very, very interesting play with the notion of the truth we to the truth Right? Um, and then finally, um, last but not least, um, we've got um, uh, Fairul Dharma, who works um, predominantly in painting, drawing, and three-dimensional interventions. And he also works in history, uh, philosophy, relationship between text and images, and he's interested in interrogating or questioning issues of historiography of the Malay archipelago through the medium of his art. He's been um, in many group exhibitions and presented projects in Australia, South Korea, Malaysia, and I was particularly interested in a very recent one, which is um, titled Moya, um, a series of artworks which are about, I guess, colonial representations of the Malays that play to me with notions of framing and erasure in very, very interesting ways. Okay. So those are our three participants. Without further ado, I'll uh, hand over to our first speaker, which is John. <laughs> Singapore in 1858. 
So Wallace picked up Ali as a young man, and they traveled throughout Southeast Asia. Ultimately, they ended up on this very important little island near New Guinea called Tanate. This is an island very famous now in the story of Wallace because it was here that he would uh, conceive the theory of evolution by natural selection independently of God. Wallace did it on his own on this island, so it's a very famous place in history of science. But it's just as important for Ali in his life because he met his wife there and got married, I think in January 1859. But Wallace had gone there and taken Ali there to kill things like this. Birds of Paradise, which live in the Guinea and the islands around there. Tanati was the closest place they could get. That's why they went there. And Ali uh, killed some. He definitely shot some of these. This is the King Bird of Paradise. But not only that, uh, Ali eventually became Wallace's main bird shooter. Uh, the term they used was hunter. He was a hunter. That was his job. There are no references to Wally collecting or shooting anything else. No insects. No mammals, just birds. So he was a specialist. He went out all day long with a, with a gun and he would shoot birds. So here are some birds that we know uh, are they actually gone. This is the ivory breasted pigeon. Wallace called this one of the most beautiful birds of the East. It's because Ali shot one and brought it to him. Wallace didn't bag this one himself. This one, the red bellied pigeon, was shot by Ali. And the guru. This is a species discovered by Ali, but of course in those days, uh, whatever was collected by the assistants was always attributed to the collector himself. So Wallace was always credited as the discoverer of these new species. But it seems from, from the records I've been able to get them together that Ali probably collected almost all of Wallace's birds, because Wallace specialized on insects, something that uh, required a lot more expertise. Here's another one that Wallace had. Rufus necked sparrow ball. And then the biggest prize ball. The most famous bird Wallace collected during his voyage before was a new discovery, a new species, Wallace's standard ring bird of paradise. But actually, you might say it should be called Ali's standard ring because it was found and discovered by Ali, who knew very well what he had found that it was a new, a new species that they had never seen before. He brought it to Wallace with great pride. Now, not only did Ali shoot birds, but another part of his job working for Wallace was to preserve them. That meant he spent long days or evenings and mornings sitting in front of their hut or cabin, wherever they were staying, skinning birds, drying their skins, preserving them, and stitching them up and suffering them. So, that's Ali's job. Now, I have something very special to show you. Something Ali actually made. Ali's hand made this. This is one of the hundreds of birds, bird skins that Ali stuck to preserve for Wallace that survive in European collections today. So this is one that uh, they bagged on Tanate in 1858, just before Ali met his wife, I presume. Uh, and here's another one from Sumatra in 1861, a crested jay near the end of the voyage. I can't be certain there were a few other assistants, but it's almost certain that these were done by, by Ali. So there's some of his handwork that's actually survived. So they carried on from island to island, uh, and Ali, who in the beginning of the voyage had been the most junior member of the team, he had initially actually not been collecting assistants at all, but had just been a cook and a general servant who gathered firewood and but gradually he became a bird skinner and then a shooter, and eventually he became Wallace's head man, his most trusted uh, assistant. And he had, Wallace had lots of uh, trouble with his assistants, but never with Ali. He needed someone trustworthy, he needed someone to go and pick up his money. If uh, he was ill, it was always Ali that he turned to, that he could trust. So when the voyage came to, the, to an end in 1862, Wallace returned to Singapore and was wrapping up, having to sail over forever to England. He gave Ali a final gift of uh, an extra payment of money, in addition to the monthly salary he'd been making. 
and also he gave I mean, his guns. And Wallace gave him his guns and other equipment. I guess what Wallace was never going to be a collector again. He made his money. He was leaving the whole country. So he gave all this to Ali. And Ali suddenly flashed with cash, chose to go out and buy us a suit of European clothes, which he had never worn before. And Wallace then had a famous photograph taken of him as a memento for himself to take up. And this is it. This is the original, as it's as in London's Natural History Museum. So there's Ali, aged, I don't know, perhaps 18. We have no idea. Uh, dressed as Wallace as for the first time in European clothes, which Wallace didn't think suited him nearly so well as his, uh, his own clothes. If you look very carefully, you can see that he has not tied his bow tie very well. And he's, uh, he's tucked the end uh, into his waistcoat. Coat. But he does look very, very young. So what happened to him after that? Well, Wallace later wrote his famous book, The Malay Archipelago, about his voyages, and Ali has mentioned several times. And so, as Wallace's book became a, a uh, bestseller, the thing is, of course, people knew about this uh, assistant, and was remembered. But other than that, he vanishes from the pages of history. He is, without doubt, one of the most obscure characters you could find in this, one, this whole story, because there are very few references to him. He's almost never mentioned. Very scattered remarks. So what I've done is I've, um, I've put together everything that uh, I think survives from Ali from all of Wallace's two books and so forth to try and reconstruct Ali as much as I can, uh, the historical map. And uh, I put all this together in an article that will be coming out very soon. Here's some of my uh, main findings, which I'm quite happy about. First of all, it's almost certain that Ali could not be he would not have gone to school where he grew up. And there are no references to him ever in his reading. I also don't know if he spoke English. Wallace only says that he partly employed Ali so that he could learn Malay by speaking Malay with him. Now we know later on we have a sentence supposedly by Wallace, uh, sorry, by Ali in English, but we can't really be sure if he knew any. Maybe. Maybe you know, a few words, maybe he could speak. We just don't know. Um, secondly, yes, I mentioned the first book, The Only Two Birds, and interestingly, I called it uh, Ali's Gap Year. It's usually been said that Ali was his constant companion throughout the voyage, but actually that turns out not to be true. For an entire year of Wallace's voyage, Ali was not with him. He stayed on Tanate with his new wife. And he continued working for Wallace, and went to the next door island of uh, Kidolo or Amahera to continue to shoot birds in uh, Wallace's employ. But after a year of being apart, uh, suddenly Ali um, turns up again uh, on the same island uh, with Wallace, and they continue the rest of the voyage together. So I call it Ali's gap here. Uh, and finally, his wages. Now, Wallace's accounts are very sketchy, very incomplete. He never actually gives. Wages. But to make a long story short, one of the little fragments and bits and pieces that remain, it seems pretty likely that one of his, uh, Ali's wages were uh, 10 florins, which was equal in those days to five Singapore dollars, or 15 shillings for this month. So, well, how much was five Singapore dollars worth in the 1850s? Well, uh, it, was about, it was the same amount as the wage for a, the lowest rank of native police assistant. Singapore. And there were a few other jobs that were worth uh, five dollars a month. It's not a very substantial wage, um, but I think for Ali's perspective, he probably uh, was well paid. I think it was in his own perspective. Well, there the story would go cold, except for of course this man, the American naturalist Thomas Barber, visited Tanate in 1907 and later wrote about the fact that one day an old Malay man walked up to him and said, I am Ali Wallace. And Barbara, who of course knew Wallace's book by heart, was amazed to meet uh, the same Ali. Uh, but he says nothing about it. We have no idea what he did. 
for the rest of his life, apart from the fact that he won a set in Singapore, and decades later he's seen him tonight. It makes sense, that's where his wife was. He had returned, he had enough money, but what did he do? I have no clue. But I have one suspicion. Andy had made an excellent living so far, traveling with the European, employing as a hunter, and he had two excellent European guns, lots of equipment. Maybe he continued working that way. Don't know. But I did recently find this intriguing photograph of a man from Ternate in the 1870s, dressed as a hunter. That's the only caption we have for the photograph. A Ternate man dressed as a hunter. I have, I have the slightest suggestion to say this is Abby, but it is intriguing to think that perhaps he may have continued working in the same strain. So there we go. That's a brief sketch of what we know about the historical Abby. Thanks. Thank Thanks, Bill. So, um, Isabel next, right? So I take on the story where we start. <laughs> um, my encounter with Ali was first um, as I was researching different types of failures that you find in science. And one of those that I was particularly interested in is what happens when uh, someone finds something in a relatively formal setting or not but a significant finding, scientific finding, but nobody is there to report it, or the person who has found it doesn't actually know or does not fit into the right frame for it to be understood and heard by the rest of the world. There's a difference between finding something for yourself um, and then proving it beyond doubt for yourself and proving it to the rest of the world. And one of the reasons why the proof might not go beyond uh, your close surrounding might be because you're not heard, either because you're not speaking the right language, or even your culture is so different that your way of proving something might be different from the frame in which people are used to hearing these words. And so starting with this questioning, I decided to look for a character that I could build uh, a story around it. Um, and Ali is the perfect character. At the time, there wasn't much information about him. Uh, in last year, it was the centenary of Wallace's, um, Wallace's death. And so there was a big, well, trial. Not as big as Darwin's centenary, but there was uh, more information that came out on Wallace. But I started the work in 2009, and my copy of the Malay Archipelago was an old pattern version that hadn't been reprinted, book hadn't been reprinted for, for a while. So definitely not, not many people had heard of Wallace around Singapore. Uh, but as I read the book, I was immediately attracted to one of the assistants, and it was Ali. There's no doubt about it. 
John said, yes, he had over 100 assistants. Not all of, not 100 I mentioned in the book, but at least five or, you can gather easily five or six names. Only Ali comes out as someone with a substance. Um, all we know about him is he's called Ali. So that was, my first job was to give him a full name, Wong bin Muhammad Ali. Because if you're going to talk about someone, he has to have a name. So I looked around and, and discussed them. This was done pretty quickly. I, I wasn't at the time trying to make something very, you know, get into much detail, but first you have to give him a name. So what do we know about him? Well, the, the next thing I did was to give him, you know, full body, because just a, a torso is not quite enough. So, you know, make him a, a full blown character. So, this is Wallace, the person who was traveling uh, the archipelago west. We now know the story. And what I want you to focus on is the hat. We know that he did, uh, Wallace did give at the end of the travel, of his guns, and that's very important. But to Wallace, the hat might be more important. So this is a map, a crude map showing some of the travel. I mean, the, the, the red dot is just showing you basically the distance between Singapore and Ternate, to give you an idea. Borneo in the middle uh, is where um, Ali Wong originally came from. But just to show you that for, for this young man, it was also a very long travel. It's not like he was just going next door. So he was also discovering new worlds. Now, there are many gaps, and there isn't very much that we know about this character, so let's flesh him out. Now, what would happen if, after having traveled with Wallace for a while, for over four years, Having grown up in an environment which nurtures a certain way of seeing the world, what if you put the two together and you give some materials, such as the guns and other equipment, to a young man who's eager to discover more of the world? Well, maybe in 2009, the Malay uh, Journal of Science would be showing, would have been showing something like this, uh, the proof of explaining how the physics of how seeds fall down. So I'll be taking you through some of the notes that this we had to, you know, re reconstruct in order to imagine who this character really was. So this is possibly his notebook. What if his vision of the world was something like this? A very circular oops, very fast. A circular view of the world where everything is connected, all the species are connected. Just move to the next one. This is Darwin's view of the world, or of how species are connected to each other. It's a famous drawing where he first imagined that species are actually interconnected. What if that was just a natural thought from Ali in the first place? These could be some of the drawings. Um, these seeds are commonly found. They're called uh, a tree is called a curling. Uh, and you can see the seeds if you walk in the forest, the seeds fall down rotating. So you can imagine all sorts of, it just sparks the imagination, you try to imagine the physics of how these things fall. Another one of, another interesting finding is this batik. Most likely died by, or Produced by Ali's wife, that would have been like a collaboration. If you look very closely at it, you start seeing chromosomes at different stages of cell division. You can see the cell wall in between. So it's very likely that Ali found a way of making a microscope. What material did he have at hand? Not very much. Ternate, yes, is very important scientifically. It used to be a very important port uh, from the point of view of, um, because it was one of the sultanate. So yes, it's one of the spice islands, a lot of you know, commerce. But at the time Ali was there, there wasn't much commerce, I can tell you. There wasn't much material available on the island. 
So bamboo with a tiny bit of copper here and there, not very much. But somehow there was a way of making a microscope so that we could find a way of looking very closely to these cells. That's another bad thing that shows even more convincingly that he did see chromosomes at different stages of cell division. And for reference, this is a, book, a picture found in a book in 1882 by Fleming, um, depicting some of the first Western images of cell division. What if he invented electricity? Durian is known for being able to produce electricity if you just connect the wires to the inside and the outside of the thread. There's a more detailed drawing here. Electromagnetic uh, fields, possibly using sand. We don't need very much um, material in order to see the vibrations. You just need to think cleverly about how you arrange these things on the appropriate surface. Um, this is where Wallace's hat comes in very handy. Um, I have an inkling that he used the hat to produce what might be some of the very early photographs uh, in Ternate. If you just put a leaf at the end of it and you put a lens at the other end of the hat, what you have is in effect a very crude camera which can actually produce uh, very detailed images of at least landscapes, probably not birds flying or people walking because it takes a while for the image to be etched onto the surface. But like we see, we can imagine all sorts of technology being devised using very simple mechanisms. And all you need is possibly an interest. I mean, one, uh, I did follow Wallace for four years, and there was this gap here, so he could have just stayed back, but he did come to Wallace to follow him for longer, so I think he was a very perseverant character. There's some drawings of Wallace sitting hunched under his, under his, uh, one of the houses where they had to stay, once on one of the island all sorts of characters from the islands they visited, showing a variety of uh, faces. And then finally, for my project, one of the things that I was interested in doing was to travel around the places where Ali had been and try to ask the people simply if they knew anything about him. My problem is that my Bahasa is not very functional. You can just about wonder who, which doesn't, actually can get you very far. Um, so what I did was to produce uh, a graffiti. But I come from Singapore. My graffiti is a light graffiti. Uh, as soon as I go, it disappears. So what this means is it only comes out at night. Um, I don't actually need that much electricity. I just, a durian will do. Um, and you, have, you, you beam it at night, and within five minutes, there's people around me, because this is what happens in these remote places. People were asking me. So at first I didn't know really how to engage. Speaking in English, the conversation didn't go very far. By the time I reached, reached Ternate, though, I had found someone who would write to me a little bit in detail who Wallace was and who Ali was, so that I could actually ask people. And no, people did not know anything about it, but what they did is they called all their friends and said, Come, there's something happening here. Let's have a look. And they started discussing who this character could be. And I'd like to finish on this one. I think this might be one of um, Ali's descendants. And what I would like to suggest now is, uh, in collaboration with John, we should go to the Natural History, of, um, Natural History Museum, retrieve some of these samples, find Ali's DNA, and look for the descendants.
Sacanagem. Just read from my text. Um, good evening, thank you for joining us. Uh, Dr. Ben Wai, Dr. Lee Chu, Dr. Hogan, and so on. In March 2015, I presented Moya, a solo exhibition presented at the Planet Gallery. This exhibition introduces the foundations of my ideas and research interests to the world. Hand used archival photographs as references to aid me in painting this portrait and scenes. The use of painting for me was important because of its Western historical tradition and its abilities it has. Painting, according to Philip Weston, is an illusion, a piece of magic, and on, from his own words, what you see is not what you see. The reference photograph of Ali informed me that Western photographer took the only photograph of Ali. The photograph informed me of Ali's existence, it informed me of, its, of his features and visual characteristics as a man from this part of the region. Additionally, I too had thought that he was taught within the Western school, perhaps due to what he wore with his clues, I assume, rather speculatively that he could have also been attributed as an individual who possessed a great capacity for thought and knowledge on the academic world. I chose Moya as a title not only for my relation to the work, but also to its meaning and ancestors. But deeper into Moyang is an inquiry, a thirst to find out if there were intellectual heroes who are all mine from the Nusantara. The painted portraits that you saw just now, or scenes, are not of my personal or family histories, rather of individuals who were predecessors in certain fields of thoughts of this archipelago, be it science, art, or literature and languages. What really was these individuals who were born from this region itself? Or for the lack of better word, natives from the Nusantara. Ali is one of them. In the painting, portrait number three, Ali Wallace, these visuals were covered with charcoal, exposing the dress he wore. The painting includes an identity not of his birth. It informs viewers that he was probably a Western man. However, from today's discussion, we know that Ali was from Sarawak, lived in the 1800s, spent several years of his life as an assistant to Alfred Russell Wallace and was last known to have settled in Ternati, Molacca's Islands in the eastern part of Indonesia. Portraiture is a genre with a long history in life. Portraiture too has a will and energy of its own to inform and conjure narrative and emotions of the painted individual and the painter. The clues are in the gestures, the sitters, garments, as well as its facial expressions. It presents at times minimally and ethnography of a period as well as a fictional or romanticized idea of the city. Ali's portraits were stocked with charcoal with a many idiom in mind. Harimau mati meningakan bela, malahan manusia mati meningakan nama. In English it means, when a good man passes on to the next world, he leaves behind his good name and his good deeds. Before I explain further why these pictures were covered with charcoal, allow me to just give you a background myself. I am born and raised in Singapore to a Muslim family and the act of painting human portraits is viewed as a person and they are respected. And in addition to that, I come from the generation as to what Salih Jaffa, a local Singaporean contemporary artist also mentioned, that I am from the generation that had lost the transitions of our memory of being a Malay or Javanese, hence creating an anchor point for Ali. My role as an artist can be explained with a quote um, by Salih Jaffa also. Um, a statement. He mentioned, an artist is a maker. If he is good, we call a creative man a creator. But if he is a Muslim, he already knows that there exists a supreme creator, and so we assume the artist's interest is to reflect his works or even his creations. Based on these ideas, there is more than just a drama of artistic creation, but rather an encounter between the material and the soul, which reverberates through the concept of unity and the immensity of the supreme creator. Thus, the artist undertakes his creative process in total accord with the universe and of nature. The results lie not only according to one's imagination, but also according to the nature of objects, bringing forth the laws and qualities which manifest through the objects themselves. In these paintings, the objects are the writings by Russell Wallace and photograph of Ali, which now transforms, as you can see, as the painting, and also an object. To add, the second reason is due because I wanted to project an inquiry. Could a covered feature of the face be considered as a portrait, 
what is and how can portraiture be viewed. The intention was to contribute again to the visual landscape of portraiture and to continue the discussion of what and how can portraiture be to suit our present day's ideals, manners without neglecting my faith and beliefs. Dr. Dijun first introduced me to Adi when she presented Wong, a law school scientist at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in Singapore in 2010. What attracted me to Ali initially was, of course, the geography that he was from and that he was an assistant to a renowned natural historian, Russell Wallace. It was one of the most intriguing moments and I remember she mentioned science and the Western world has still to recognize Ali and that is why I made Wong. This led me to pursue on creating a painting of him. Hence, you can consider portrait number three, Ali Wallace was painted due to this influence and with a similar belief as that of Dr. Dijun. In art, within the context of Singapore, we too fail to recognize individuals such as Rodin Sani, Juan Luna, Basuki Abuda, or Arif Abdullah as predecessors to our canon of art history. I can only assume it could be due to political borders that separates the Nusantara, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, and the larger ASEAN. Moya was a platform for me to find out if there were politics of local influence within the Malay archipelago before the countries were divided by borders. With my naive and speculative mind, I believe that Ali is. Ali Wallace, Ali Obwang, or this Malay Bong, is a figure to be observed as an individual who had contributed to a certain degree to the developments of science. For me, his humble deeds as a tukang or an assistant are representations of Moody, an intellect or wise man. Moody is the best key and influence within the self of forming and retaining conceptions and general notions of intelligence, reasons, discernment, and judgments. This is it is a philosophy of the Malays, and Budi also extends to covered ethics as well as intellect and reasons in order to accommodate the culture and faith. While I was an assistant to two Singaporean artists, Jane Lee and David Chan, and of you, through their experience and observations, I learned and understood how to relate ideas and trigger emotions with this and other. This led me to form my beliefs and understanding of how should I produce a work that needs a balance between the criticality in producing an abstract or conceptual painting and the sensitivity and carefulness in producing representational art without disregarding that this medium painting has a long tradition of historical past that I now have come to borrow for my own. I believe that within Ali's case as an assistant, Wallace and his struggles, assisting him with his collections and translations, he had somehow helped Ali's growth intellectually as there was an exchange. There was an exchange and discussion perhaps undocumented for certain areas we do not know of. I'm not a historian, I graduated in fine arts where we were trained to search for our individual language through visual, textual and oral or other modes and mediums of expression, creating an experience in any form with and without an audience or readers. Similarly, we were trained in an orthodox, unorthodox manner and with that I adopted a non-linear approach to areas I am interested in as a framework for my research. From Moya, this non-linear approach has brought me from Radin Saleh to Abdul Abdullah Qadir, to Raja Ali Haji, to Ali Wallace, and Syed Hussein Alatas. I'm not a writer, neither am I a theorist, and not an expert in English, or Malay language and literature. I'm not a scientist, nor am I an intellect. However, despite all the shortcomings with Moya, I had identified the link and drew a map of the individuals who had contributed to the growth of our wisdom and intellect within the new sector. This is with the understanding of accepting the relation to the concept of unity as conceived by the Supreme Creator. Specifically, because I have a fear that my friends or children, theirs and me, would not have a sense, like me, a rootedness and connectedness to our neighbors who at some point were part of a larger land with their shared history. For me, I is a tool to inquire and explore Ali's existence to a wider audience. Additionally, to inform the people of my Nusantara today that we can not only write a study, but we do have Ali, who was from Sarawak, and neither I am within the archipelago to follow him. With this, I believe the relevance of Ali to our present day is not only to quench the test of my own, but also to draw a map of intellectual heroes and really highlight his contributions to present the legacy that he had left behind for us to use as a vehicle for our tomorrow's. Thank you. Thanks very much. I guess what we'll do now is we'll all four of us come up and try and sit in a semicircle or something like that, please.
So as always, um, the three very interesting presentations that I think have some kinds of intersections, although I think we can explore them in discussion. I mean, one maybe place to start might be to think a little bit about what might be the core of each um, person's discussion. And I was thinking with John, it was really the question of what can we know from history and what are the limits of what we can know from history. Let me tell a linear narrative of Heidi's life um, and let me stop at what I cannot know. And then for Isabel, it seemed to be, at least for me, more of a question of how can we supplement history? How can we think about what certain kinds of histories include or hide? What they don't recognize? Can we think of a new kind of story without being involved? And why it seems to me was interesting, I mean, it seemed to be thinking in terms of the context of contemporary Singapore um, and thinking of a loss of certain notions of identities of a Malay ness or Malay tradition. And then trying to think of exactly what we said, Budi, the um, idea of wisdom being transmitted. Um, and seeing maybe Ali then as part of a series of processes of exchange, right? So non-linear connections. So like people like um, Alatas and Munti Abdullah were mentioned there. So that I think there's some really interesting connections um, between the two different talks. Um, I've certainly got some things I wouldn't mind talking about, but did anyone have any initial questions or responses or anything you'd like to clarify from any of the three speakers?
like you interact with yeah, 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 yeah. Well, maybe I could sort of offer a reflection on that point. Um, if we think about these these two people from so long ago, uh, Wallace had travelled all the way around the world and he met this young man and was in effect entering Ali's world as much as Ali was entering his. Because Wallace was living as the only Westerner very often uh, in a place uh, in which Ali and Wallace were both visitors, both foreigners. They were always in different islands where neither of them were native. But Wallace was still in Ali's world. It was in Malaysia, usually in Malaysia, but also in places where other languages were spoken. So I think um, Ali indoctrinated Wallace into his world in a way that we often don't think about. I mean, Wallace must have learned to speak Malay in the way it was spoken in Sarawak in those days, which it may have changed since then. And he must have learned a host of other things from Ali. He would have been Wallace's constant companion, the person that Wallace learned from in a thousand and one ways, uh, all sorts of cultural things, and also uh, about the science. One tends to think that science comes from Wallace, but one of the things I learned was that Ali had uh, a very keen eye for, for, for the birds and the so forth. And he would bring back not just dead birds, but he would go off on expeditions and come back and tell Wallace lots of information about what we could wear and so forth. So a lot of the scientific output that Wallace later came out with comes from Ali. So he can play a much bigger role than we previously appreciated. If I were to cross that, what about the... I think you mentioned everything. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just wondering about this. It seemed to me that you're... Your discussion was more about certain kinds of Malay traditions and I guess retrieving or placing Ali within that rather than as a. And you did mention earlier on about the notion of it, uh, intellectual exchange or something like that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, one of the reasons why I think that Ali was was because I believe that the Borneo Islands, um, Malayan and Java, we all exist with a single story. But, because of the contemporary bodies that we now exist in, that's what separates us. And because of that, so there are many other things that we lost. Like um, for myself, personally, we don't, I don't have a certain rootedness with the Malay culture or the Japanese culture anymore. And for me, like like what Camila also mentioned, um, and John mentioned that uh, that exchange, like I mentioned earlier, there was an exchange uh, between these two individuals and, and an interaction. And on a personal ground also like once there's an interaction between these two individuals, definitely there's a lot of like things that they learn from each other like, beyond cultural yeah. or beyond intellectual things. Yeah. And also like I mean thinking of the um, the illustrations that you or things you show, I mean there's a notion that you I think you mentioned of a portrait as being a Western form. And yet you want to disrupt that in some kind of way. If you wanted to reclaim it or, or reuse it. Yeah. I think it's not reclaiming, but it's more yeah. of like yeah. uh, making a, a commentary on how I am living now. Because like how the, uh, how I was trained from school and when young, we were always looking at it from a business perspective. <laughs> and um, uh, the previous that I mentioned also, Harimau uh, Manti Manika Kan, Belang and Manusia Manti Manika Kan, Kanama. It basically talks about the needs of the human uh, and, and how the individual just exists within the name at the same time. So the visual aspects of it is, is just the, the piece cut off and then the name that exists right. the existence of it. Right. Yeah. There was, okay. Um, and there's one question at the back, I think Felipe first, and then you can, yeah. I think we'll give the mic, one mic out to people at back. Hi. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate a lot and uh, very nearly this effort in the three presentations of giving voice to the voices as it were, or bringing back the hidden in the in, in a history of global science, which I think is very relevant in the rewriting of history, especially in the layer to the you know, in sort of post-colonial sense of things. And in that effort, I wonder 
whether, especially in Isabella's presentation, I wonder where the perhaps the methodological limits of traveling around and imagining who could Ali, who could have been that person. Because it seems to me that from from your words, what I what, what I keep is that it was this effort of imposing the image of what you could you think he could have been. So in that, in, I wonder whether you can elaborate on that. Where is, where is the agency of a in your work? I'm not sure I understood the question. You're asking whether... I mean, in, 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 in John's work, there's, this, there's a very uh, concrete effort of finding sources of where was he and what was he doing, right? Whereas your work is more an imaginative work. What could have he been doing? But then, what are the limits of that? I wonder, I wonder whether in going there, are you imposing on what you want him to be? Going there for me was just another way, uh, once I had reached the limit of realizing there was no way I could, I could think like this boy, why don't I try to go and start imagining, still knowing very well that I would never be able to imagine. And so the, the work has stayed what it was meant to be in the first place, just to um, make it a character that people are more likely to look at um, and stretch as far as I could in uh, the, the story in terms of giving him as much um, relevance to what the Western world might want, but also what the local Malay world might want. And I found actually an amazing interest in people when I, when I talk about this work, and I always preface it by saying, this work is really a work of fiction. I don't use these words as such, but I explain that I found this character, and so this character is very much has very much lived. But I have made up the rest, and people forget this part. And very soon, I have them coming back to me and say, "How come I haven't heard about all this?" So people only hear what they want to hear, which is something that I found very interesting. If you look at that little five-minute video, uh, which is going around on Vimeo. Um, I have made it absurd enough that I thought nobody would take it seriously. So it's meant to uh, stop people from saying, oh, this is obviously a word of fiction halfway through. They should know soon enough and then be ready to listen about the possibilities. But what's happened is people haven't seen this at all. It doesn't matter how bad the French accent is or the Monet accent <laughs> is or the impossibility of a depart from the philomics, coming from Abuja to come and study what happened yeah, in Ternate. Yeah. It doesn't matter. People crave the character like that so much that they hold on to the story. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. I of the of a representation of right? And it seems like that's the There are no limits. There are no limits apart from my own imagination. And the purpose is not to go as far as I can. The purpose is really to give a voice to, to him. And, and everybody is entitled to it, in a way, to put their own voice. I remember that. It's an interesting question, I think. Um, we had a couple of questions. I think, first of all, at the back, and then with you. I was thinking, okay, so the front end. Yeah, and the, 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 all, all, the, all the information we get of, of all this. 
Yeah. 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 Y
a mythology and information about um, the various Canadians of the world through the home bill. Um, also the Sarimano, which is a, like a chicken that carries a fish in its mouth. And it's a messenger, it's a, a very common symbol only found in Borneo and Sulawesi. Even the, the word for chicken is manu, which is different from ayam in the rest of the Malay speaking world. So there are these nuances of place. And like Chikian said about uh, allowing other world views to butt up against a very Western approach. Um, so I just think it's when you start imagining worlds and you start imagining worlds through science and other ways of approaching science, it becomes far more exciting if you let go of um, science, uh, that for one form Western science. For example, uh, something that came to mind was a documentary a friend of mine made called Dayside, and it's a documentary about the fishlessness. And it's, an it's, a, it's a documentary, it's a real documentary about real science of Bugis fishermen who died in the sea and through the sounds that they hear underwater of vibration and distance and all of this, they can identify what fish, how many, whatever, and it affects them, they, they do it to this day, and it's a very old tradition of local science, if you like. So it's these kinds of things that if they, if they had a direct conversation, like for example, a very clear link of birds, and opening up an imagination of world views through birds, that would have been a bigger conversation, I think. For me, that's what I kind of wanted. Yeah, yeah. But was that specifically for Isabel, or was it for all three? Um, it was just sort of a comment on, on yeah. when you when you're when you're investigating mm -hmm. a biography right, or yeah. a person. There's no mention of Borneo, yeah. and yet you keep talking about birds. And the minute you look at any culture from Borneo, there's oodles of material about birds. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, it's the first thing I'll think of. Yeah, it's yeah. the hornbill is like a symbol of Dayak culture. Right. Or or, you know, the Sarimano of Bajau Bukit yeah. is like yeah. obvious to me. It's, it's, so it felt, felt like a missed opportunity to make a link with his job yeah. and where he comes from. I can respond in saying that yeah. I completely accept all the shortcomings and I realized those shortcomings within a few months of having started the project. Yeah. I didn't realize what I was getting into when I picked Ali. I didn't realize the scope of what I would have to go through. And I decided either I go and find out all the bits of information, I go deep, deep into it, and then it will be a lifetime's work. Or I remember what it was that I wanted to talk about in the first place, which is just mention the possibility that if you are from the wrong language at the wrong time, your science will not be heard. It's, it's, I'm a scientist, and this stays with me easy, even when I do art. And I understand perfectly everything yet that you're saying. And I agree, and I love what you're saying, and I'm saying in a way, it's open, let's do it. Yeah. Let's continue. The book is not closed, yeah. and we can keep going. I'm doing things with my limitation, and I have to just remember that it, it was just meant to be a small paragraph. It's, it's very exciting. Different, yeah. um, I remember research. hunting birds, when I, because I grew up in Kampo, and I know, how you hunt birds with what kind of cage that you make and how you catch a bird. We grew up doing that, right? And even the design of how you catch a bird is, is, is kind of ordinary. So that, but there's an opportunity there of how did his knowledge influence, I mean, the, the very real uh, task at hand of uh, how did he contribute. There's, there's uh, bird trap knowledge that, you know, so, and there's evidence of the traps in the museum. Stuff like that is but just those to me are not the, those are interesting, but those are not the science parts that yeah, I'm interested I in. Yeah. They contribute to how you will catch the bird. But in terms of the thinking, you know, I'm more interested in how he views the world and how that might have very well influenced how uh, Wallace came up with his theory of evolution. Which to me, how about it was just a normal way for, for Ali to see the world that you know all the species are connected through each, through each other. But it's the scope is open. That's exactly. Yeah. I've got one here, but I think you were first. Did you want to yeah. say? Oh, oh. Yeah. I, don't, I think we. I think now we're, we can try again. Yeah. I think that's a great point. You know, that, uh, it was 
really illuminating. Um, just to build on your point about this sort of different cultural registers of knowledge, uh, this question is really for John, but to less extent also for Isabel and um, Fairy, the arts among us. I mean, why this interest in Ali as a character? He seems so shadowy as a historical personage. Why this interest? I mean, is it about recuperating certain native contributions to science in a very Western sense? I mean, I'm not, I, I hope this is not an unfair question, but I'm just wondering about um, where you're coming from. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, on my own, um, previous writers have only ever written about Wallace or whoever the Western scientist is that they've been writing about. Well, I've written about Wallace a lot, published several books on him. And so I'm expanding outwards. I want to find out more about what happened back then. And so my own uh, article on Huntley that I've just done is an article about Huntley. In which Wallace is just a shadowy figure in the back. So Ali was someone who all of us have found interesting. We wanted to know more about this young man. And so that, that, that's the nature of my research. So it was not about, uh, the, I've not been chasing Ali in order to understand how he contributed to Western science, but to re reconstruct it from the tiny fragments that remain uh, the life and the activities of this interesting young man. John might get angry with me to say this, but uh, for me, like the uh, Malay Archipelago was actually a literary text rather than a historical text, but it's okay. Um, and like uh, the brief mention of Ali is of course very interesting for the global one because like you wouldn't imagine that oh wow there exists a scientist that we can call our own from that period. But uh, as time goes by, you know, like of course like the East, we oh. have our own kind of science that is separated from the West. And we all know that. And one thing that, that, that really triggered me to paint him was because amongst the other uh, individuals that I painted was because like from my generation we don't know anyone else. We don't know we don't have any references from this part of the region. Um, one of the other painters that I uh, sorry, one of the other individuals that I painted was Radin Sali and none of our local or the contemporaries might be spoken of him. And for me, being a Japanese also like the kind of things that we all initially spoke the same language. And that's one of the reasons why I painted it. It's because of that relevance that I felt. And I feel like we have that similar thread going around. Or forgotten along the way 
uh, in, this, in this past century. While on the other hand, I, it, it also brings up to mind um, somewhat different instance of, let's say, East and West intersection and interaction that took place not too far from Tenate, about 200 years earlier before Wallace, and that was um, by the German Dutch uh, soldier um, from the Dutch in East in this company, the man known as um, George Eberhard Rumpius or Rum in his native German. So he, he was, unlike Wallace, though he was also a natural historian, he was not a sojourner, he was not a traveller, he was he eventually based himself, married and stayed on the island of Ambon between Sulawesi and uh, a new Papua New Guinea. And it was there that he wrote a massive treatise um, for the Ambonist Herbal and Ambonist Curiosity Cabinet that it literally catalogued basically all the flora and fauna of the region. And but reading that you do be like you realize that while the words were his, um, the information, the knowledge, the terms of reference, the users, the warnings, the, um, recommend, the recommended usage, um, it was in a way a bit of a, of a, sometimes a, a cookbook, basically, because you're, you're talking about what was good to eat and what was not good to eat. All that, all the information was literally from all the people um, indigenous people on Unborn and the surrounding islands. And I think it, uh, it was true to say that that knowledge carried down some 400 years later today and has been found to be pretty much um, accurate, factual as far as um, most biologists can tell. And that presented in a way, I would say, a very, very striking counterpoint um, to Wallace um, Wallace's experience as far as this kind of east and west interactions go in this region. Okay, Did you want to say anything about it, John? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks for the comment. I, I think one of the interesting things that seems to be touched on quite a lot is a kind of sense of different kinds of knowledge. Um, and then a notion, some people are now bringing up some form of indigenous knowledge versus a form of lot knowledge that someone like Wallace brings is a classificatory knowledge, it's a knowledge that is drawn from the Enlightenment. And precisely how these two different kinds of knowledges come together is actually, I think, quite quite difficult. Because if you start, I mean, one of the classic, I think, issues was founding Yale and US College about three or four years ago. And what they wanted to do was to have a Eastern tradition and a Western tradition, right? Because of where we're located in Asia. And yet the whole notion of an Eastern tradition is very, very different and very, very less easy to establish in a way than a Western tradition. Because, of course, that kind of concept of the university itself and certain notions of the knowledge are actually largely Western knowledge. So you've got this kind of problem of different knowledges but also different ways in which the knowledges are framed. And I think we're sort of coming across some of that in some of our discussions. So how do you... How do you know, how do you retrieve other kinds of knowledges on their own terms without in some ways placing them within a certain kind of grid that automatically appropriates them? And this is something that John would not agree with, right? Um, but I'm just trying to sort of, um, I, I mean, John, would you see the history of process as being entirely neutral? That, um, or, or do you think nothing's entirely neutral? Yeah. I mean, but but you, you would see the, I guess the primary function of what you're doing is trying to establish some form of historical record and that there's just places where you can't go and that one shouldn't go as a historian because one can't ever know. Am I right on that? Yeah. 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 Anybody else want to either take this discussion further or, or go in any other direction? Yeah, let's go back there.
Okay. Uh, the question number one is uh, when Ali stayed in the Ternate, uh, did he teach uh, villages about science? And the number two is uh, what is the main point that Ali wrote in his uh, book? Okay, that's all. <laughs> so, um, I think it's a good point about whether he did teach to any uh, teach science to anyone because that's the first point that I made about um, spreading science. Is it's not just what you know, but what you let the rest of the world know. At this point, I don't know, but it's something that I definitely have to put in. Um, What's in his book is still being written, so what you saw was fragments. Um, I don't think there is a real direction in it. In, in, in my way of doing it, it's just discoveries one after the other experiments. Um, but the idea, <clears throat> the, the general idea is that Ali is really looking for patterns. Um, and what he has is his foundation and what he has seen Wallace doing. And He's looking for new patterns from using new techniques. That's the essence of what the book might contain. I'll just share two little anecdotes about that. Uh, one, the American scientist Barber, who ran into Ali um, and wrote about it many years later in his memoir. That's long been known. But I found two other tiny little fragments, also written by Barbara, about meeting Ali. And they're very brief and mundane, but what they show is that while he was, while Barbara was in Tanate, he would check things that he wanted to know about Ali. Um, so he'll say something like, he'll say something like, I, I found this uh, lizard, uh, which doesn't seem to be known on any of the islands, and I checked this with Wallace's Ali. And so you can see that, well, from that little fragment that he's considered someone who was very experienced in what he was talking about. Uh, for Barber, the Western scientist. Anecdote number two. Wallace says in an obscure article many years later that when he was in the East, when he was in Tanate, uh, a, a young uh, lad from Sarawak, it's Ali, okay, who was traveling, he just didn't name him but it's obviously him, who had traveled with him and who had been to Singapore and had there seen tigers, particularly a captured one. When they were in Tanate, Wallace overheard him on the veranda entertaining the locals with wild stories about tigers and his adventures with them and how they turned into different kinds of animals, which isn't a type of local folklore. But anyway, the locals in Tanate, because tigers do not occur anywhere near that region. So Ali was showing off and telling stories about tigers. And I can't help wondering if he impressed his future wife with his stories of tigers. So, so I mean, if, if Ali tells these stories, have you never been tempted yourself <laughs> to move outside this very sort of tight um, historical narrative and maybe as, as some historians have, write fiction or some, something like that. So have, you, have you been tempted at all? Or to follow Ali's example? Tempted now. Tempted now. Anybody? Being Malay yeah. 
if that's possible in right. today's Malaysia, Singapore. Right. Right. I think if you go to Indonesia, it's easier to, yeah. be, to yeah. exceed being Malay. Yeah. But if you're from Sarawak, and then you yeah. have to yeah. be somewhere in the Malayan yeah. space, yeah. then this question of being Malay becomes a big question. Yeah. Does he have to be Malay, I guess? Or can, you know, is there a Malay view of him that is different yeah. from other views of him? Right. Because, of course, the name Ali, if you grew up in a Malaysian school, then there was Ali, Achong, yeah. and Nenny, right? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, Ali yeah. then becomes this generic, yeah, becomes yeah. a type. He's not even a real person yes. in some instances because he becomes this reference point, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Ali or Amala. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, it's not yeah, Amala, yeah, yeah, Ali. Yeah, yeah. And there's another whole thing there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just, yeah, just that. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Um, to just first answer your question, if uh, the race is an issue or not, personally I feel it's not at all. Like, um, I think we are, uh, at least for me, I'm, I'm just interested to find out the alternative narrative apart from the, what we know of the Western narrative that we, I, I'm always reading it. So, even if he's Chinese or Indian or whatnot, it's, I can still relate because it, he represents the unheard or the voiceless people yeah, and there's something that, that, that especially in the context of Singapore because uh, like, apart from him I was also meeting Radin Saleh and yeah, Raja Ali Haji who we weren't thought of in um, art history classes or the historical classes that we had in the school so like for me like race is not at all an issue um, is this trying to conjure up a certain sense of imagination that there might be a possibility that he exists or he does not? I don't know if I answered you. <laughs> no, you did. I mean, I, I think it's interesting then that the examples that you cite yeah. tend to come from a Malay Muslim or Javanese yes. trajectory. Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting that your perception is that the race is not an issue, which yeah, is yeah, yeah. easily, yeah. I mean, I'm not. Because it itself is a story as well. Like I mean, I mean, this itself is a, is yeah. another story. Yeah, and that's a story that I mean, if the South Station section of the National Gallery is going to tell, because we start with Radha Sali, if I remember, um, looking at it, um, um, uh, uh, some of the previews. So again, it's a story that takes maybe a contemporary Malayness and puts it back into the past. Is that what you're saying? Or, no, or there's so many of, doing, can go, of right? doing it, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I'm just curious, I mean, what would the meaning, I mean, historians have done some work on this, but what would the meaning of Malay have been to, say, Wallace at this time? John, John do you know? I mean, how, how, how people considered Malays and how people not considered Malays at that time? Yes, yeah. I was very wary about what to say about Malay, mm -hmm. because of course we have nothing from him himself. I have no idea what he called himself. I only know that Wallace called him Malay. But what, uh, now that, that's, what does that mean? Um, what would what, what he have called Malay? But then, of course, he's well aware of the Rufus or of Dayaks and other types of people. So he didn't use those other terms. And uh, judging from the language of Europeans living in Sarawak in those times, it, that I, I'm quite sure by using the word Malay for someone, they meant people who lived uh, in the Kampongs along the Sarawak River. Um, although there are many subtypes of people there, they may not call themselves Malay. In fact, they probably didn't. But uh, that's the term Wallace uh, used for him. We have, uh, interestingly, only one sentence of Ali's voice survives in Malay, which is in Wallace's uh, diary. And it, this, the line does occur in the Malay archipelago, but in English. But in the original diary, I can't remember, I can't remember it right now, but uh, Wallace writes down what Ali said while they were staying on the, uh, in the Aru Islands. I mean, it's uh, a different kind of people. They were staying in a, in a crowded house, and the locals, uh, Wallace had rented a corner of the house, just jabbering on and on and on. They never shut up. The place was so noisy. And Ali said to Wallace, wow, the Aru people are really strong talkers. And Wallace thought this was quite funny and wrote it down, but in, in Ali's original Malay. So those are the only words of Ali that survive. Um, and then Wallace went on to say that um, this is very uncharacteristic of 
on these type of people who are very quiet. So maybe with Ami's last words, is that a good place to end our discussion? Or only words, I guess. Is that the, um, uh, the only authentic words we actually have? Is that a good place to end our discussion? But um, I'd like to thank the panel very much. I mean, I think it's, you know, these kind of things you can't solve in a way. But I think, you know, artists and historians coming together from different perspectives ask about really interesting questions that we do find difficult to solve. Um, but I found it very interesting tonight. So, and I'm sure we can carry on discussions, you know, hang around afterwards. If there's any refreshments left, that'd be very nice. So thank you all very much.